Zoom. Honorable Member Sir Michael Bessendra. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know it's late into the evening, and I will not detain the Chamber unnecessarily, but I believe that it was absolutely necessary that I enter this debate this evening um, because it's a debate, sir, dealing with an amendment to the Severance Payments Act. And the Honorable Attorney General set out the legislative framework and the amendment so well, so I don't need to go there. But, Mr. Speaker, I believe it is absolutely necessary that we put this situation that we find ourselves uh, in, in, in the context of where we are and where we have to go. The tourism sector, Mr. Speaker, and you, as you're aware, I have a vested interest in that sector. Um, no conflicts whatsoever. But the tourism sector did not intend to cease to carry on the business. But the business, Mr. Speaker, diminished due to the closure of borders, um, resulting in no supply um, of visitors to Barbados. That obviously would have triggered um, an issue in respect of hotel companies and other businesses having to reduce um, their labor by putting workers on short time or in some respects, Mr. Speaker, um, placing workers on layoff. The result was primarily due to the fact that the country was faced with uh, a number of cancellations. When I say the country, the tourism sector, especially the hotels, were faced with a number of cancellations. And as a result of that, they had to respond accordingly. Barbados certainly, Mr. Speaker, is not alone. Um, and what we are debating here tonight um, is also being debated and have been debated in other regions within CARICOM, for example, St. Lucia, and I'm advised Jamaica. But the issue of the 13-week trigger speaks to the fact that an employee who's employed with a company and has been placed on short time or layoff for 13 consecutive weeks reserved the right to serve notice to his or her employer of the intention um, to the right to a severance. Obviously, there are procedures, Mr. Speaker, that you will have to go through. For example, the employee will have to write uh, indicating um, that they're terminating their services, ob observe the notice period, and allow the employer to count to the notice and so forth. But the reality, sir, and based on all that has been said today, that I also think maybe the time has come for some labor reform. I have gone on record before saying it in this very chamber um, that I think we need to start looking seriously at the harmonization of labor legislation, not to disadvantage workers but also to bring it into its proper context, especially when we are faced with these situations. But Mr. Speaker, the impact on the tourism sector and workers within that sector has been very much real. We had a situation, Mr. Speaker, as alluded to, that you had refunds and there were a lot of cancellations that had to be processed by the hotel sector. You hotel sector, Mr. Speaker, and this is something that has yet to be told. The tourism sector, the hotel sector in particular in Barbados, was facing a severance payments bill. Was facing a severance payments bill, Mr. Speaker, anywhere between $250 million and $300 million. And certainly, faced with that situation with such a magnificent cost, there's absolutely no way that the hoteliers in Barbados could foot that bill. And as a fact, Mr. Speaker, it will undermine and we will not know tourism as it is today. I know, sir, of companies, and I heard it in the debate today, that there were some companies that were faced with 1.3 million. I can tell you that there was one hotel group that was faced with a bill of 9.2. I know another hotel company with a group of hotels in Barbados that was faced with a bill of over $20 million, sir. So it would not, and I think these are the facts, Mr. Speaker, that we have to put on the table when we're in these discussions so that the people out there will understand why it is the government will have to take certain actions. But it's not only, Mr. Speaker, about the protection of a severance payment um, uh, bill 
to the hotel companies in Barbados. It is also about the preservation of employment for Barbadians who work in that sector, indirectly and directly, Mr. Speaker. Take, for example, what has happened with, with, with taxi operators. They, too, have been impacted. They're registered, most of them, as self-employed persons. But when you look at the sum total, and if you were to assume that they were earning maybe $1,000 a week, and they are now going to be unemployed, well, not unemployed, but business would be reduced for a long, prolonged period of time, let's say even 22 weeks, Mr. Speaker, that sector alone, I have estimated when I did some numbers that that sector alone would have lost over $11 million. So these are self-employed persons who would have lost at least um, $11 million. Mr. Speaker, we also have a situation within the tourism sector, and this is how real it gets, where the workers in the tourism sector, as a result, no fault of their own, Mr. Speaker, no fault of the hotel, hotels as well. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, you find a situation where if you look at the sum total of workers employed within the tourism sector, and you look at an average wage that they would have been paid, plus the service charge, Mr. Speaker, you find yourself that income to those workers that they would have otherwise received had they been employed, exceeded over $106 million, Mr. Speaker. Nothing to do with service charge. When you are faced with a situation that the national insurance contributions, and this is to put it into its proper perspective, we're now, as said before, yes, the Barbados economy will see a fall off in the GDP. It is, yes, that is right. But when you look at sector by sector, and when you break down the sectors, you have a situation where the national insurance scheme will also see a decline in their revenue, what you call their contributions, because people are unemployed, and as a result of the unemployed, you no longer have the employer and the employee contribution being paid into the national insurance. And again, Mr. Speaker, that's over another forty million dollars. You're faced with Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, with a situation. With, had you had approximately $100 million or say $106 million out there as income, the Barbados Revenue Authority through POE, Mr. Speaker, would have benefited substantially. That bill, Mr. Speaker, not bill, that contribution to the Barbados Revenue Authority would have exceeded, I'm sure, $30 million, Mr. Speaker. And that's what we are faced with here on the large scheme of things. We have a situation, sir where you have ancillary services in the sector. The people who, for example, are involved in supplying companies, I'm sorry, supplying food and vegetables and, and meats and liquor, Mr. Speaker, you're faced with a situation where they have concerted, and I, and, I, and I got this information because obviously we're doing some research, where concerted, conservatively they have lost, for example, about $90 million in sales, Mr. Speaker. So the situation before us is very real. And when you think about the small business operators, Mr. Speaker, those who are involved in water sports, those who are involved as vendors, Mr. Speaker, craft, etc., they too have felt it. But Mr. Speaker, fortunately, we have a very caring government so that this government was able to put measures in place to protect some of the self-employed self persons. They were also able to put other measures in place to protect other people to cushion the blow, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we've done. But, Mr. Speaker, not only the government, the workers, but even utility companies will be hard hit. So when we look at it, Mr. Speaker, if you had to assume that we had a $2 billion industry as a result of the COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, yes, we are going to see some fall off. And I will leave it to the economists and the other people. But I'm sure that if you look at a fall, the fall in revenue from the tourism sector between anywhere between March, late March, middle to late March, and July, Mr. Speaker, we are talking about millions of dollars. But this government, Mr. Speaker, responded. When will the sector return? We don't know. Because obviously, we are faced with a situation where we depend obviously on borders to be open elsewhere. We depend on policies to be dealt elsewhere, Mr. Speaker, and to be approved elsewhere. But the reality, sir, that we are managing this ship because we have a responsibility to manage. And thus far, Mr. Speaker, this great Barbados Labour Party has done an outstanding job in managing the situation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the reaction 
taken to get us to where we are today. I call it responsible decision making, Mr. Speaker, by the labor unions, Mr. Speaker, by the government, and also members of the private sector involved, especially this, on this occasion, the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, in order to amend the severance payments act. It was responsible decision making. And this Barbados Labor Party that come from the bowels of the labor movement, Mr. Speaker, will obviously have a duty to ensure that labor remains strong. And by every action, that is true under this Barbados Labor Party. But we are also faced with a situation where because of the responsible interventions by the government, the Barbados Hotel Association, and in particular the labor union, sir, we will now be in a position to preserve employment, um, employment levels in Barbados. And that is our duty. Because we have to ensure we maintain employment levels in a post-COVID-19 environment. But if you have a situation where workers are going to be severed, and the opportunity exists where people can alter the staff and levels because through several ways, Mr. Speaker, you don't want that in Barbados because this is a service industry that we depend on as a country. And as a result of our services, we need to keep people employed in the tourism sector, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will even go so far as to predict, sir, that as a result of what we're doing and as a result of the protocols that we have to implement regarding um, cleaning and sanitizing, Mr. Speaker, the possibility exists that employment levels will also increase in a post-COVID environment in the hotel sector because there's a lot of cleaning to be done, sir. And I'm not belittling jobs, but you have to do a lot more work to maintain the safety of your businesses and also, as a result, the country as well. Mr. Speaker, we have to safeguard but you can't put the severance payment fund, Mr. Speaker, in a situation where it could be called upon to pay out north of $200 million, Mr. Speaker. It would be impossible. It would be impossible for everything that we are doing, sir, as a government, to have to impose that on a severance fund will be, it would cause us serious problems. So that the responsible approach to the decision making like I said, with the labor unions, the government and the BHD must be commended, Mr. Speaker. And it was not easy and will never be easy, especially for labor. But we have to look down the road and look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that we want to emerge from a post-COVID-19 environment, a stronger, better country, Mr. Speaker. And that is what we are about, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can also tell you that even as our approach as a government, the Prime Minister announced a, a benefit known as the, um, the, the Business Interruption Benefit for Self-Employed Persons, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you on the floor tonight, Mr. Speaker, that the National Insurance has started to pay benefits to those whose businesses were interrupted as small self-employed persons, Mr. Speaker. I can also tell the Chamber, although I didn't like how it was done in respect of how the workers were treated, but the National Insurance Board approved at its May meeting the payment of over $700,000 to 86 former workers of Chaps Restaurant. You know we made Chap, Chin Chin, Prima, and those are, and, and, uh, and who was Mr. Speaker. But we have to recoup it, sir. And we have to recoup it at inter with interest, sir. It has to, we have to get it back, sir. But this Kieran Barbados Labour Party government took a decision because you have the severance payment fund, Mr. Speaker, to allow persons to go through a process. And once they went through that process, Mr. Speaker, we did that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and we are doing these things. In addition, as you heard, the Honourable Minister of Finance making the point earlier today that the National Insurance, the, the unemployment fund, Mr. Speaker, paying out almost $15 million to those workers who have been on layoff, Mr. Speaker. And that bill too will run us north of 200 million. So this is what we're doing as a government. And when I look back, Mr. Speaker, and I contrast what we are doing as a government to what the last government did, Mr. Speaker, there's no contrast, sir. We heard it not so long ago, and we've heard it on occasions before. That if we not put this economy on the foot is on today, Mr. Speaker, 
it would have been trouble in Barbados tonight. But we don't have that issue, sir, because we can manage. And if it's one thing that the Barbados Labour Party is known for, is management of the fears of this country. Along with that last, sir. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Barbados Labour Party came to office and found almost 26,000 claims outstanding national insurance scheme. Between 2014 and 2018, Mr. Speaker, we got them down to 2,000, Mr. Speaker, and paying out millions to people who deserve it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these, you, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we came to office as a Barbados Labour Party government, and we found almost 26,000 claims, outstanding claims, Mr. Speaker. This caring Barbados Labour Party went to work to ensure that we commence the process of clearing the backlog. Mr. Speaker, we are down to less than 2,000 claims that were outstanding from 2014 to 2018. And the Barbados Labour Party was not in government during that period, Mr. Speaker. We also have a situation where we found a lot of outstanding claims in tribunal, Mr. Speaker. You had a situation where, going back to 2009, there were persons who had claims filed with the tribe Seventh Tribunal. Can you get a hearing, Mr. Speaker? Some of them, sir, unfortunately, passed on. Can get a benefit, Mr. Speaker. But the National Insurance Board has put in place a regime led by a subcommittee of the board, sir, to ensure that we clear that backlog. So having cleared the first backlog, Mr. Speaker, the board now is on to clearing the second backlog, Mr. Speaker. So that is our, you can call it, Mr. Speaker, the second plan of attack on backlogs, Mr. Speaker. It's a lot of work, but we are going to do it. And we still, Mr. Speaker, have $113 million in this in the severance fund. But we are going to do our best, Mr. Speaker, to clear those claims. And I give you, Mr. Speaker, and the country at large, the commitment that is as long as I remain chairman of the National Insurance Fund, the duty falls to us to ensure that we clear the backlog, Mr. Speaker. So I really, I said, Mr. Speaker, I don't want to detail the, the House because I know they always did. But this is our song, Mr. Speaker, that we're going to sing. And sir, and Mr. Speaker, on the issue of the tribunal, you know they have some people in another camp that would want Mr. Speaker to throw some pop shots on occasion. But Mr. Speaker, the, I am not going to speak to it in here tonight, but there will come a time when there are some people who will have to explain their tenure as chairpersons of the National Insurance Servants Tribunal, but that's not for now, Mr. Speaker. As you will detect, sir, Mr. Speaker, perhaps you might believe that I'm ready for a campaign, but I shall be ready whenever the bell is called. Wrong, sorry. But, Mr. Speaker, I go back and I wrap up on this point. The amendment, Mr. Speaker, is about safeguarding the future of employment in Barbados. It is about ensuring that we come out of this crisis stronger, but at the same time recognizing that the workers, yes, have made a substantial contribution and continue to do so. But the issue for us is that, and the question that we have to ask ourselves, if we did not come in here, sir, to amend the legislation, would the country be able to afford a $250 million severance bill, even if I were to be conservative, Mrs. But I know it's more than that, sir. Would the Tourism businesses in Barbados, Mr. Speaker. Not only hotels, not only tour companies, Mr. Speaker. Not only companies involved in the supply of food and fruit and vegetable meats and all those businesses, Mr. Speaker. Not only the, the persons who are involved in water sports, etc. But would we have the same structure in a post-COVID environment if the tourism sector was faced with this bill, Mr. Speaker? I say to you, I don't believe so. So this is about protecting us, and along with all the other efforts being made by this Barbados Labour Party government to protect people 
and to make sure that households survive, Mr. Speaker. We have a responsibility and we are duty bound, sir, to protect it. So, Mr. Speaker, I know there were other comments being made, sir. I will not go to those comments tonight. But I really want to say that I wholeheartedly support the amendment, Mr. Speaker. It is good for the country. It is good for the workers, Mr. Speaker. But more importantly, it is good for the future viability of businesses who employ people, Mr. Speaker. And we need to keep people employed in this country, especially in what can be described as uncertain times globally. We have to keep workers in employed. And on that note, Mr. Speaker, I'm much obliged. Thank you. Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I started this morning, the day, and I intend to end the day now. And I shall not be long because I am aware that everyone else, and I'm looking around, has had a long day. But what they're perhaps not saying is that we've had a long year. And these six months feel like already a whole year. Mr. Speaker, I have indicated in this house in the last few speeches that this will clearly be a challenge in here for the people of Barbados, but I know we shall make it. And I know we shall make it because we have brought to this country again, and not to say again, the spirit of a shared burden and a shared prosperity. And that is the essence of the philosophy of this government and this party. I have on previous occasions indicated that even when we were going through the establishment of the Barbados Economic and Recovery, Trans Economic Recovery and Transformation Program, the BERT program, that that program was premised on asking all to share an adjustment rather than asking labor, who traditionally would have been the ones shouldering the adjustment in the early 70s when we went to three-day week between 74 and 76 with the crash program, in the early 90s, when 4,500 people and the 8% pay cut, and the leader of the opposition may want to learn what a cut is by reference to that, as opposed to what is happening in Barbados today, which is an investment option. And again in 2013, when the last administration chose, they announced that they were sending home 3,000 people, but I don't think they ever got past 1,500, 1,700, somewhere around there. But this government chose to share the burden fairly because we believe that on 166 square miles, there really is no room for I or id or ego or whatever way you choose to call it. The only room there is is for us as a collective. You know, the Africans have a concept called Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U, -U, that has fascinated me for most of my life from the time I learned about it as a teenager. And it simply means I am because we are. I am because we are. And one day you will see that throughout my entire career I have held firm to this philosophy because I do not believe that on 166 square miles there is room for the dominance of any one sector beyond the other such that all that is left is crumbs. And the journey of this Barbados Labour Party over the last 82 years has been without doubt definitively to create that balance to trigger what I call the closing of the circle of enfranchisement. And I say it all over, all the time. First time in Bridensill in 2013. 
on the eve of an election, the two members for St. Michael South and South Central were not yet thought of in that context. But I think they may have heard the message and came on and joined it and are living it more perfectly than I could ever want. But that circle of enfranchisement included worker enfranchisement through Social Security passed by the, the, the Democratic Labour Party in the 1960s, prepared for and settled by Sir Grant Lee and the Barbados Labour Party before. And that is the nature for the most part of government and governance in a small nation. And that is why the last decade hurt so much. Because for the first time since 1940s, 1944 in part, when the Barbados Labour Party put forward a slate of candidates that became effectively a majority within the parliament, that for the first time since 1944, we had a government that so varied from the philosophy of being able to right-size the rights of workers with the influence and capacity of capital, but also looking to be able to allow workers to own capital. And that's why I keep talking about closing the circle of enfranchisement, which is the mission of this generation of persons. Started by previous governments, and in particular of distinction, was the contribution of the Tom Adams government between 1976 and 1986. But the workers' rights that we have evolved and developed in this country have been critical. But even in doing that, we have always understood that workers are not above capital and capital is not above workers. And that without a recognition that we have to hold each other's hands, particularly in the context of outside crises that have the capacity to thwart and to destroy everything, we will not achieve. If we had a hurricane, sir, it would be the same thing. If a hurricane came and destroyed our hotel plants, you would not be able to get the plant back up and running in 13 weeks. And we would have faced the same dichotomy and dilemma. We have a pandemic beyond our control. And the last member who spoke, and indeed all others who spoke before, made it absolutely clear that the quantum of liability for severance would simply bankrupt the hotel and tourism industry in Barbados. Now, who benefits from that bankruptcy? Buildings that would be shut, pipes that would not be open, toilets that couldn't flush, Mr. Speaker, we left Harrison's Point barely closed for a few years, and look what happened. All of the work and the money, twice, not once. And in that lies a lesson for the government and all future governments. Twice it was repaired before. And on the 27th or 28th of February, when we went there, after leaving the renaming of the highway in Spike Stone, after your, one of your distinguished predecessors, what we saw was over 12 foot of bush across the entire property. The Attorney General and myself went, along with some others. Every window out, every door out, every piece of conduit out, and I want to give this by way of example to show why we could not even contemplate allowing the tourism sector and the assets, particularly within the tourism sector, to be left to the vagaries of bankruptcy in this country. By the same token, 
We also know that you can't just leave workers, and the Honorable Member for St. Peter made the point well, that in the settlement of the structure of the legislation of the Severance Payments Act, there were provisions that provided clarity and certainty for workers, such that they could plan out their lives and know that they could not simply be the victims of arbitrary conduct on the part of those employing them. And Mr. Speaker, that appreciation for certainty is one that we maintained. And we understood that while we could not stay at 13 weeks, we could not go to so long a period either without reference and without conversation most importantly with the workers to determine what they themselves could want, recognizing that there may be some among them for whom the reality of working in a post-COVID environment, or in a COVID environment more accurately, I should say, would become a difficult proposition even if their heart, metaphorically, was in it because their heart literally may not be able to make it under the exposure. And the member for St. James South correctly stated, Central, sorry, correctly stated that his life over the course of the last week, along with the member for St. Peter, and in the latter stages, the Honorable Attorney General, the member for Christerity Central and myself had the early part of it. But we said, no, pause the process and let us get it right. Because at the core of it is also understanding that we need to walk together through this crisis in a way that does not destroy the industry, but in a way that does not write, wipe out and write off the rights of workers that have been legitimately fought for in this country and have been legitimately preserved because all of us effectively are from the working class in this country over the last 80 years. And we have a duty to continue the journey of continuing to protect them. And that is why comments made by the Minister of Tourism and the unions as to some practices intruding into the sector, not just in tourism, but in other sectors too. And, and don't get me wrong, Mr. Speaker, I understand it because when men under pressure and people under pressure, they start to run and they start to worry about themselves. But you have always to tell yourself that you can't run that fast and leave everybody else. And that you didn't get here by yourself and you're not going to get out by yourself. And what may appear to be safety really is, really, might even be an illusion. So that, Mr. Speaker, this government therefore paused the process and insisted on the level of dialogue. There was no dispute. It wasn't in the paper every day. But we did it in the way that we know how to do it best. Bring people together in a room. Settle the common mission. And then work out how best do we get to that mission from the respective positions that we each have. From the position of labor, from the position of capital, and of course from the position of government that has responsibility for the stability and security of the nation and all of the parts therein. And I'm satisfied, sir, and I end the day as I started the day that I feel proud. Proud to lead a country that understands that there is a cause that is larger than each of us individually and each of us sectorally. Nobody promised us an easy road. But I know that that commitment to cause and country 
that creativity that caused men and women to sit in a room for the better part of a week until we crafted something that all sides could live with, that compassion and caring for each other from the part of capital for labor and labor for capital, and the confidence that we don't need to find it only from outside, but that we could craft it from a blank page, is what has resulted in this piece of legislation being before this honorable chamber. I want to salute the honorable member for Christchurch, for St. Michael West Central, who has done an amazing job as chairman of the National Insurance Scheme since this government has come to office. The records he has given you to clear 22 out of 26,000 claims in less than two years. Claims that were wrapped up over a four year period as part of adversarial financing. You may ask, what is adversarial financing? Adversarial financing is simply not paying your bills to give you finance that you can't get from nobody else. <laughs> so that when you had a situation where you are taking in less and paying out more, the next best thing to do with your backlog is to let it rise, 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 because you don't have to take out any more money to pay. And that was what was happening to the people of this country under the last government, being punished for financial and economic mismanagement by being made to wait extraordinarily long for matters that ought to have been settled in no time at all. Mr. Speaker, those things are wrong. They're wrong. And, and, and I say that to you, conscious that it's not easy. I know it's not easy. But you can't make people suffer who can least carry the weight. And many of those claims were for people who could least carry the weight in this country. And that is why government understands that even, as, even with this provision, it is going to be nigh impossible for capital to upfront the cash for those who may even want expedited severance at the end of the 26 week period. 22 weeks we're moving to. Four weeks you have to opt. And at that point, the employer will say, Well, we're gonna, I'm going to open back up or I'm not opening back up. I ain't got the money to pay. And this government has specifically included a section in this legislation to allow the Minister of Finance by order to provide for an expedited process for the settlement of claims rather than, I think there are people from Grand Barbados still waiting for claims, seven, eight, nine years. No, Mr. Speaker, these things are not right. And I say, you know, the Lord knows we don't pretend to be perfect. We know we're not perfect. But we must not settle for those things either that cause people to suffer. Similarly, not only has the Honorable Member presided over an NIS that brought down from 26,000 to 2,000, those claims. As of Monday morning yesterday, and I believe that the member may have said it, but in case he didn't, I'm repeating it. There were 48,222 claims from approximately 27,422 individuals for the Unemployment Benefit Fund. And I suspect 42,516 of those claims, not I suspect, I've been told, have been paid to the tune of $49,717,000 in this country 
over the course of the last two months. That's 49.7 million. Less than 300,000 shy of 50 million. When Errol Barrow, Tom Adams, or any other prime minister who occupied the offices, any other person who occupied the office of prime minister, would never have contemplated that they would have seen a situation where the Unemployment Benefit Fund in this country would pay out near $50 million in two months. Never. And that is why the member for St. Michael West Central is so correct in saying that the concept and the thought of a severance payment fund carrying the load that the current legislative framework would have imposed on it is one just simply too heavy to bear for this country to succeed. And our four parents knew what it was to step back two steps to go forward five. There's nothing to be ashamed about in that. What is more important is that as we step back, we all step in together, and when we come forward, we all come in forward together. The philosophy of shared burden and shared prosperity. And I say, because a time will come in this country again, when we will be doing well, but when that time comes, remember whose hands held together to build the foundation for that prosperity. Now at the same time, I'm conscious that we're really, really living in strange times. And that if you blindfolded yourself, some of the practices that we are hearing about would cause you to believe that it was in a pre-1950 Barbados. In a Barbados where the right to universal adult suffrage had not yet been secured and the right to labor rights had not yet been appropriately conferred on the workers of this nation. Where the conditions of the Moyne Commission with respect to the imbalance between worker and employer was what it was. Now I understand, as I said, the anxiety. But I urge all employers in this country, as I urge all workers, now is not the time for any side to so assert their rights to the exclusion of the other if they want us to get out of this safely. There is always, in a small nation such as this, a common space that allows us all to live. One of the disadvantages of smallness is that we may not all be able to push as hard and go as hard and have as much as each individual may want. One of the advantages of smallness is that if you fall, People can pick you up quick and lift you up. There are some people who like the idea of like stolen the virtues of smallness. <laughs> but just as there are disadvantages, there are advantages. And the hardest thing in life is to know. And if we know, then we can cut the cloth to suit. We can make the decisions that we are making. And I give thanks. Honestly, that, that thing called a social partnership exists in this country. And this government perhaps has opened up to the social partnership more than any government in living memory, and I can say so because I was in the Senate when the social partnership, I was a member of the other place when the social partnership was first formed in this country. So I have been here watching all along. 
But I really do believe that the courage that it takes for all sides, no, and I mean all three sides, sometimes to agree to measures that may not be immediately apparent to the constituency base of each of the three, but which in the medium to long term have worked to stabilize Barbados in a way that makes it the envy of many across this world. Mr. Speaker, I don't want to speak any longer because I believe that these matters are clear. I would have much rather not be here to give a speech of having to reflect on why the Severance Payments Fund cannot take the attack of tens of thousands of severance payments claims in a way that the Unemployment Benefit Fund has had to take it. I would much rather not be here tonight discussing that. But in life, it is not what we want or what we wish for, but it is what it is. And we cannot move away from the facts. And I give thanks, as I said, to the labor movement, in particular the Barbados Workers' Union and the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association as the representatives of the owners of the hotels and tourism services in this country. I give thanks to the wider private sector who themselves will also under the limb of 6A1 are likely to be able to benefit. But I also recognize that the policy decisions of the government, and we will have cause to speak to the country either later this week or early next week, about how we can continue in a safe way to generate more economic activity in Barbados so that many of these workers who are now receiving unemployment benefit, and who, by the way, the majority of whom want to get back to work. The notion that people want to stay away from work, COVID has cured all who were work allergic. <laughs> because they didn't know that they were house allergic too. <laughs> and I hope that that will allow for a renewed sense of purpose and commitment and to recognize that as COVID has taught us, life first and foremost is precious. Family and relationships are precious. Our work is precious to our mental sanity in many instances and gives us that sense of purpose and that appreciation that we can do things in a way that makes other people's lives better, our lives better, facilitate our ability to help people through the earning of wages and salaries and our ability to save. And we have many, many things to be thankful for beyond those that are immediately apparent in the environment, in the oceans, in the air, and all of the other things from the reduced economic activity that has taken place. So Mr. Speaker, I want to commend this bill to this Honorable Chamber. I also want to take time out to commend the Honorable Attorney General and the Chief Parliamentary Council, their department, and those who they've had to rely on almost incessantly, <laughs> who have mercifully ensured that their skills honed over a distinguished career as a draftsman are not lost to the country even in their retirement. And I say so because I know what it is to serve in his position. And I know that there is no one day that you wake up and know what the day will end like, you hope. And especially when you have responsibility for the police force, as he does. And therefore, to do all that he is doing while at the same time putting this honorable chamber in a position in a timely manner to do the things that are critical for the administration of the country's affairs and to allow us to be 
as stable and as secure as the Constitution contemplated we should be, and to give us the power in this chamber to pass legislation for the good governance of this country, even if on occasion that legislation may have to be passed with a special majority because there are circumstances that have happened in the life of this country that the normal legislative framework cannot accommodate. And that is why what we are doing here today with this bill and the one that was passed earlier today is not unusual in the constitutional affairs of this nation, but in fact has been contemplated by the drafters of our constitution because they, in their wisdom, knew that there would be events and circumstances that they could never contemplate because such is the nature of humanity and human beings. So, Mr. Speaker, we come here on this rare occasion to pass sunset legislation to help us keep our heads above water as a nation. To ensure that we do not bankrupt our tourism industry, which has paid our bills for the better part of our post-independence life. And to ensure that those workers who have uplifted the tourism industry are given the opportunity still to be afforded the rights that were contemplated that they should have with the passage of the severance payments legislation in its original stages, even if those rights will not be not extinguished, but deferred or lengthened for another period of time that happens to coincide with the unemployment benefit access such that they have cash in their pockets for the full 26 weeks as the unions would have fought so valiantly for on their behalf. And then government steps in to begin to discuss with the tourism sector and with the NIS separately two separate issues. With the NIS expedited processing for those who truly are still taking severance and working with the hoteliers to work out a cash advance payment for them, which we have to finish the negotiations on, so as to ensure that they are not left without the critical cash in their pockets to keep the tourism establishments going again in this country. And similarly, to have the discussions with them as to how they may use this unique opportunity between them and labor, the hotel owners and labor, for us to finally achieve what we have been talking about for decades, my whole time in public life, an appropriate productivity framework for workers within the tourism sector, such that there is a complete sense of ownership by the owners of capital and the owners and the workers within the tourism establishment. Mr. Speaker, if we can allow this moment to propel us to that stage, then when I refer to taking two steps back to come forward five, we would then have achieved something greater than what we set out to achieve simply with the passage of this sunset legislation. I pray and I urge all involved in this great nation of ours to come together to allow us to recraft an industry that was for the most part in this last incarnation crafted by a man whom we hail as a national hero, the right excellence of Grant Lee Adams in the context of the Barbados Development Board. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? That's more than 60 years ago. And a model that was appropriate for Barbados 60 years ago 
cannot simply be appropriate for Barbados without more today. And to that extent, therefore, I pray that this moment of intense interaction, close negotiations, continuous conversation, can continue now not simply to the passage of this legislation or the securing of severance or the advance of severance payments on the part of hotel owners by the severance fund, but that it can carry us to the next stage such that the experience of tourism and hospitality in this country will be buttressed by an unbelievable spirit of cooperation that the guests who come from far and the guests who come from near will both appreciate that whatever is happening in this house, be it the house of Barbados or the house of the hotel, is a very special experience because of the interaction between the parties. Mr. Speaker, I therefore commend this legislation to the Honorable Chamber. It is needed. It needs a special majority. It is sunset legislation. I trust and pray that the world will allow us to be able to see an end to this pandemic within this time frame. And that I know we will succeed, but the question is for us, buoying, buoying everyone else who may be struggling to keep their heads above water to keep as many people above water as we can through the passage of this legislation and other similar measures. I'm obliged to you and beg to move that this bill do not re be read a second time. The question that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Question is that the speaker do not leave the chair and the house resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the ayes have it. This house is now in committee. Clauses one to five. Question is that clauses one to five stand part. All, all members in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. We think the ayes have it. Clauses six to ten. Madam Chair, I beg to move that clauses six to ten stand part. The question is that clauses six to ten stand part. All, all members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Report. Beg to move that you do report to his honor, the speaker, the passing of one billing committee. The question is that I do not report to his honor, the speaker, the passing of one billing committee. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Chairman of the committee has, has reported the passing of one billing committee. Third reading. Third reading. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Speaker, as indicated earlier, this bill requires a two-thirds majority, and therefore, we will do the voting and members of the arts to signify their approval. 
Marcel, do you have everyone? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Miss Motley? Aye. Miss Bershaw? Aye. Mr. Marshall? Aye. Miss Ford? Aye. Mr. Simmons? Aye. Lieutenant Colonel Bostick? Aye. Mr. Goodenagel? Aye. Mr. Hinkson? Aye. Mr. Rowe? Aye. Mr. Sutherland? Aye. Mr. Prescott? Mr. Griffith. Aye. Your Honor, Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Payne. Aye. Mr. Thorne. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Rear. Aye. Mr. Abrams. Aye. Mr. Strawn. Aye. Mr. Phillips. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Ms. Husbands. Mr. Ford. Dr. Duguid. Mr. Toppin. Ms. Cattle. Aye. Mr. Jordan. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Dr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Speaker 28. Honorable members voted in favor of the bill. No abstentions or no one voting against. Therefore, this bill has reached the threshold of two-thirds majority of the House and passes in accordance with Section 492 of the Constitution. The bill is so passed in accordance with the Constitution. The speaker, we commit all of private members' notices. I'm member for Christ yourself. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to give notice of the resolution as follows. Whereas the central theme that runs through the entire history of Barbados subsequent to English settlement is the struggle to overcome racial discrimination and oppression to eradicate the many negative racial legacies that were derived from centuries of criminal enslavement of Africans and people of African descent and to create a society, a, a non-racist society in which the fundamental human rights of all people are respected and whereas the people of Barbados are conscious that the struggle for freedom, human rights and the dignity of the human person, irrespective of race or ethnicity, is an interdependent enterprise in which the entire human family is involved, and as such, recognizing that the United Nations has in the past adopted resolutions aimed at eliminating racism and racial discrimination, and whereas Barbadians recognize that their history has bequeathed to them a duty to stand up and advocate for the interlinked causes of freedom and respect for human rights. And whereas in light of the Barbadians' deep investment in seeing the struggle against racial oppression advance in strength and success throughout the world in general, and throughout Barbados's geographical region of the Americas in particular, the people of Barbados were profoundly shocked and dismayed by televised images of the brutal and heartless killing of the American, African-American George Floyd in the city of Minneapolis in the United States of America. Be it resolved that this House of Assembly acting on behalf of and in the name of the people of Barbados, A, reconfirms the commitment of the nation of Barbados to champion and advocate for the cause of freedom and respect for human rights, inclusive of the eradication of all forms of anti-black racism, B, extends sincere and profound condolences to the immediate family of the late George Floyd, to his extended African-American family, 
and to all American citizens, irrespective of race, who are deeply hurt by the tragedy. C expresses support for the principle that black lives matter and endorses the notion that it will not be possible to unequivocally assert that all lives matter unless and until all black lives are in theory and in practice treated with the respect and regard that is their due. And D confirms that Barbados would be more than willing to contribute human and other resources and to participate in any regional, hemispheric, or international initiative that is aimed at providing assistance to nations that are currently struggling with their national efforts to eradicate racism in general and anti-black racism in particular. I'm obliged to you. The Minister of Government Business. Hmm? Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, we have come to the end of today's sitting. I therefore beg to move the adjournment of the sitting until Tuesday, the 23rd of June at 10 a.m. The question is that this honorable chamber be adjourned until the 23rd day of June at 10 a.m. in the forenoon. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes of it. This number chamber stands adjourned until the 23rd day of June at 10 a.m. in the forenoon.